Thank you. So in this talk, I'm going to be discussing Habit Lab, which is a behavior change system that I've built a number of in the wild behavior change experiments that we have conducted on this platform. So the underlying motivation here is that people are spending increasing amounts of time online. And with uh, the average US adult now is spending nearly six hours a day uh, with digital media. And this number is only inc increasing with time. And as evidenced by the emergence of terms like Facebook addiction, people are struggling to reduce their time online. So as a result, a number of productivity tools have emerged to help users reduce their time online, such as rescue time and stay focused are among the tools. Um, that said, the way that these, basically these tools work is that users have a goal that in mind, for example, to spend less time on, on Facebook. And there are a number of interventions that are available. So for example, um, the an intervention might be to block Facebook. And then there's some outcome that this tool desires to achieve, for example, decreasing the amount of time on Facebook. Um, and I believe that online behavior change systems is actually a domain that's very well suited for studying these domains and their outcomes. Specifically, in the context of outcomes, we can actually measure outcomes very precisely. That is, every time you visit a site, we can actually measure exactly how much time you spend on these. Uh, we can contrast this to other behavior change domains, for example, dieting, where you actually need the person to self-report um, like what they ate every day, for example. And then interventions, um, where there's actually many interventions that are possible in this uh, Specifically, you can, anything that you can draw on the computer screen can be an intervention. And uh, you can actually adapt interventions very quickly. That is, every time the user visits, you can actually deploy a new one. Um, that, is, that said, uh, current productivity tools make a number of assumptions about interventions and their outcomes. Specifically, with regards to outcomes, we assume that their effectiveness persists over time, as opposed to, for example, it's effective the first day and progressively um, the time that you spend just increases, right, as the effectiveness just declines. And there's also an assumption that there's um, an implicit assumption that there's no negative externalities, that is not going to be influencing time on other sites and apps uh, outside that the one targeted by the intervention. We also have a number of assumptions about the interventions themselves. That is, there's an assumption that a single intervention is going to be able to meet most of the user needs, um, aka one size fits all for interventions, and that users are good at predicting what interventions will work for them. Um, so we've developed the Habit Lab as a mechanism to study whether or not these assumptions are actually true. Does effectiveness remain constantly over time? Do externalities exist? Does a single intervention meet most needs? And are users good at predicting what interventions will work for them? Um, so the structure of this talk is going to be, first I'm going to introduce the Habit Lab behavior change platform. Then I'm going to discuss uh, a set of three studies about them, two of them discussing outcomes, one of them discussing the interventions. So um, with regards to HabLab, HabLab is our behavior change uh, platform. And we currently have 12,000 online uh, in the wild active users across the browser. And there's also an Android version. Um, the basic mechanism is that during onboarding, you select sites or in the Android version apps that you want to reduce time on. And we'll be calling these goals. We have a number of interventions that help you reduce the time on these goal sites and apps. There's over 30 interventions available across the browser platform as well as the Android version. And just to give you an examples of what these look like, um, for Facebook, this is an example of a Facebook-specific intervention. This one, when you visit Facebook, it'll just hide the news feed for you. Uh, this is another example of a Facebook-specific intervention. This one will inject into the news feed a timer indicating how long you've been on Facebook. And then this is an example. Uh, some of the interventions are actually general. You can use them on any site. This is an example of them. Uh, and this one is, uh, this will automatically close the tab after 60 seconds. And this is an example of a YouTube-specific intervention. This one will show a, a prompt before you start watching the video how long the video actually is before it starts playing. Uh, here are examples of some Android interventions. This one, will, is a, this one is all the Android interventions are actually site, uh, site general. That is, they can be used on site app general. They can be used on any app. So um, this one will, every time you visit, open an app, um, it'll show you a prompt, uh, it'll show you a notification showing how many times you visited this app today. This one is going to actually ask you to be sure, are you really sure you want to go open this app whenever you try to open it? So the design process by which we actually arrived at these interventions, first we took a look at existing interventions on Chrome Store and basically just re-implemented them in Habit Lab itself. Um, we had a number of ideas that were proposed by experts and our users, and we also adapted techniques that we found in the behavior change literature. We have over 12,000 daily active users that are from 151 countries. Um, of those, about 30% are from the United States. Um, 
50% of them uh, prefer to use their browser in English. Um, and the most represented age demographic is 25 to 34 years of age. Uh, our users are also mostly male. So um, in the process of actually growing Habit Lab, we actually follow a number of design principles. Um, so one of them is, firstly, you have to design for good user experience because, because your, our users are completely voluntary. And if the user experience is not good, they're going to uninstall, right? So we had to polish the products. We spent a lot of time removing bugs. And uh, one of the things we made sure to do is avoid a lot of onboarding surveys and excessive experience sampling that would degrade the user experience. Um, when we were unsure what would be the, the, uh, the optimum to uh, maximize user retention, we actually ran a number of A-B tests to find uh, the good defaults that would maximize retention. We also gave um, people plenty of opportunities to leave feedback. So throughout the Habit Lab extension, there are these little feedback forms where you can just send feedback whenever you find a bug or something that can be improved. Um, if you uninstall Habit Lab, we'll show this uninstallation survey where you can ask, we can say why you're uninstalling. Um, we get a number, we leave, we get a number of emails from from users um, about uh, this is actually just from this morning actually, um, and um, we have a little Reddit where people can just uh, post their ideas about like the future directions Hub Lab should take. Um, we have a GitHub where people can report bugs and request features, and we also have a number of opportunities for our users to contribute. For example, ideas for interventions themselves. <laughs> We give people opportunities to contribute internationalization. It's actually quite amazing. We actually have uh, parts of HabLab translated into 13 different languages just by completely voluntary users on TransFX. Um, and we also have opportunities for users to contribute in terms of code. We actually have an intervention editor built into HabitLab itself to uh, allow people to write their own interventions. And people have actually used this, uh, this to actually write interventions, which we have actually merged into the main HabitLab code base. Um, but in terms of uh, what actually led to big growth, um, it actually turned out that that it was actually a lot based on like the press. So it was, like initially we had like we were like floating around eighty users, like most half of whom were our, like my lab mates, and then uh, and then like life hacker all of a sudden like somebody just just found the extension, just thought it was really cool, and wrote an article, and then like all of a sudden every like all the other mainstream press like New York Times, The Wired, it's, and like a number of Chinese sites just copied it, and we had like huge numbers after that. Um, Okay, so that's basically uh, HabLab, how we built it, um, and how we grew it. And so now we're going to go talk about some of the studies that we ran on the HabitLab platform. Uh, the first one is a paper that we presented at CSCW 2018, titled uh, Rotating Online Behavior Change Interventions Increases Effectiveness, but Also Increases Attrition. Um, so. Uh, basically, theory has shown, a number of theoretical work has shown that behavior change interventions, they su suffer from declined engagement over time, and that there are novelty effects that can provide temporary boosts in engagement. That said, if we look at existing behavior change systems, they tend to be, use stack interventions, and so they're not really making full use of this novelty effect. So this leads us to our, our research question of, well, can a strategy of rotating interventions help improve effectiveness? And so the first hypothesis that we made is that stack interventions uh, that is showing the same intervention over and over again is going to suffer from decreased effectiveness over time. That is, the amount of time that you spend on the site is going to increase over time. Second hypothesis is that rotation is going to increase the intervention effectiveness. Um, so, uh, so we first ran a pair of studies that were inv investigating uh, rotating versus intervention, static intervention strategies. So the first one was a within subject uh, experiment where we are comparing rotating inter static intervention strategies in terms of effectiveness of interventions over time that we measure in terms of the daily time that users are spending on the sites, as well as the attrition rates. Um, and we measure attrition as the amount of time that the user keeps the thing installed until they uninstall. So this is a within subject design with 217 participants. Um, our conditions were that on some days you just saw the same intervention, which we call the static condition, and on others uh, the intervention changed every ro visit, which we call the rotating interventions condition. Uh, and so we or organized the conditions into blocks of one, three, five, or seven days. So basically we would, we would randomize how long a, a block of interventions you're going to get. Um, so it would be basically counterbalanced in that, in, that, uh, in that you would have one day of, of stack interventions followed by one day of rotation, for example. Uh, or if it was, a, it was a block length of three, then you would have three days of, of rotating, rotation followed by three days of static. And for example, here, five days of rotation followed by five days of stack. And these, of course, can all be, um, these are all randomized. 
in order. Um, so uh, what we want to figure out was, do stack interventions decline in effectiveness over time? And in order to investigate this, we used the linear mix model, where our fixed effects were the number of days that the intervention had been seen. The random effects was the user ID and the domain. And the dependent variable was the time amount that was spent on the domain on that day. And we log normalized this so that we'd get normal distributions. Um, and so what we found here is that the time that's spent on, on the sites increases over time with stack interventions. So what this means is that there's actually a decline in effectiveness uh, over time. Uh, so so uh, we can actually interpret these, these numbers from our linear mix model by exponentiating these uh, predicted log time per on, on site. And basically what it tells us is that if our model predicts that on day one, uh, the user's going to be spending 116 seconds per site. And on day two and day three, there's going to be progressively increasing. So uh, the second question that we want uh, to investigate is whether or not rotation reduces the amount of time that's spent. So this time, um, Again, our random effects are the user and domain as before. And again, as dependent variable, we're investigating the time spent on the domain that day. Um, but this time, our, um, we're considering uh, the, the condition, whether it's static or rotating interventions, as well as the block length. And here we find that if the, rotation, if the condition is, is a rotation, then the log time uh, spent per day is, is going to decrease. That is, the daily time on sites uh, re is actually reduced in the rotation condi condition. That is, um, rota rotation is actually making the interventions more effective. Um, so uh, one last thing that we want to investigate is whether or not rotation actually increases attrition. So for, to do this, what we used was a Cox hazard regression. And here we were predicting the survival probability as a, as a function of the condition within the first block. So this is a visualization of how a Cox hazard um, works. Uh, basically, we have all of the users during the first day. And then, uh, and then on the x-axis, we see the days that the Hyperlab remains installed. And, um, and on the y-axis, we see the survival probability. That is the probability that they still have it installed at that time. And uh, here we're looking at the first seven days. That is the first week. Um, and as you can see, the static interventions is actually higher than, um, than rotating interventions. So static, we have 74% remaining after a week. But with rotation, we only have 52% remaining after a week. So what we found is that rotating interventions improves effectiveness but increases attrition in our first study. Our second study was a between subjects experiment in which, um, in which what we sought to see is whether or not rotating between more interventions increases the amount of attrition. Uh, this time we used the between subjects design with 409 participants over the course of five weeks. Um, and the conditions deferred the number of interventions that were being rotated between. Um, so the, th the three conditions were we had one intervention per site. So this is effectively equivalent to the static condition uh, in a previous uh, study. Half of all interventions available. So for example, Facebook at the time, we had a total of eight interventions. In the half of all intervention uh, condition, you would get four of them. And there's also the all interventions available per site uh, condition in which, for example, you'd get all eight of the, uh, you'd be rotating between all eight of the interventions for Facebook. Um, and Again, here we see a Cox hazard regression. And what we find is that rotating between interventions itself increases attrition. So the top one, uh, the one with the least attrition is if you have just one intervention, that is stack interventions. After 70 days, 47% uh, of the users are, are still installed. But in the half condition, only 27% are installed. And in the all condition, only 20% are installed. And uh, this, there's only a statistically significant difference between the one and all condition, no difference between half and all. So uh, what this would seem to suggest is that rotating, rotation itself is what's causing attrition, rather than the number of interventions being rotated between. So to investigate why, uh, so what we wanted to see next was why this intervention rotation itself was causing attrition. So we sought some qualitative feedback. So whenever users uninstall Habit Lab, we get uh, we show them still uninstall survey, which is of course per perfectly optional, but some users actually tell us why they're why they're uninstalling and. We went off and analyzed and coded these, uh, these responses. And one of the key themes that we saw was that users had incorrect mental models. So uh, this is a quote from a user. It didn't seem what I expected. Installed two minutes ago and removed it. Um, There's also a lot of dissatisfaction with particular interventions. So it was mostly the bar covering up Facebook message indicators. This is a particular intervention we had in, for in Habitlab. Um, so, so what we think is that the causes for why rotating interventions cause Increased attrition was one we were violating users' mental models, and that users perhaps lacked a sense of control. 
over their interventions. So, um, so we believe that rotation violates mental models, and so, um, and so what we wanted to do was we want to improve users' mental models about rotating interve interventions in our third study. So um, we want to see how we can reduce attrition when intervention rotation happens. Uh, to, to investigate this, we developed two different dialogues that are shown when intervention is first seen. The first one is, uh, is the mental model uh, design. The second we'll call it the user control design. So the mental model design, um, uh, basically the first time you see an inter a new intervention, it's going to show this prompt. Um, and it'll tell you, have a lab rotates between different nudges each time you visit a uh, site, uh, in this case Facebook. Um, this is the first time that you're seeing, and then description of the intervention and what it does. And just, OK, um, so this is just telling people that intervention rotation is happening, and this is the intervention you're seeing. The user control design is identical to the previous one, except this time we actually add this little slider um, where you can actually opt to turn off the intervention on future visits. Um, note that this is not a new feature. Um, in the other conditions, users can also go to the option setting and turn it off. This one just makes it a little more salient that they actually have this control, uh, and they can turn off the intervention if they don't like it. Um, so in order to investigate this, we used the between subjects design with 284, uh, 282 participants over the course of 10 days. And the conditions were deferring according to which design was, was shown uh, when intervention was first seen. So where there's none, none condition, where no design was shown when, the first, when they first saw the intervention, that is equivalent to the previous studies that we had mentioned. Uh, there was the mental model design, uh, where we showed the, the one that just told them you're seeing uh, interventions rotate, there's the intervention you're seeing. And there's the, rotate, the, the user control design, in which we also, in addition to the mental model design, gave them this little option to turn off that intervention right there by clicking a button. Um, we found that the mental model design reduces attrition by half. That is, after a um, that is, if you have no in, uh, in the baseline condition without either of the either of these uh, designs, only forty three percent of users are remaining after seven days. But in the mental model condition, seventy eight percent of users remain after seventy eight days, and in the user control control condition, also seventy eight percent of users remain after seven seven days. And there's a significant difference between the the non and mental model conditions. So what we find is that, uh, is that this design of reminding people um, that interventions are rotating to improve their mental models actually have the amount of attrition that occurs during the first week. OK, so this was, uh, the, the, this was a paper that we presented at CSW 2018. And the, basically, the key findings were that stack interventions decline in effectiveness over time. Rotating interventions improve its effectiveness, but at the cost of increased attrition. Uh, attrition can be, we believe, is due to incorrect mental models and lack of control, and we can reduce the attrition with a simple design that improves users' mental models. Okay, so, uh, the, so that was the first set of studies that we, we ran on the Habit Lab platform. Yes. So, uh, in the real Habit Lab, would you want to have both the mental model explanation and the control, or either? Like, yeah. What so, are you so I guess um, even though there was no difference between statistically between the mental model and the control conditions um, kind of intuitively like like it doesn't really occupy too much additional space to like give them that little option um, and there were indeed in their qualitative feedback like a lot of like like you like things that kind of indicate that you just weren't really aware that you could turn off interventions even though it was like very explicitly made clear during onboarding um, so um, so yeah, so what we ultimately did was we just went forward with the, the control condition, uh, 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 the user control condition, right? So uh, like every time you see the new intervention in the current Habit Lab, you're always going to be seeing that little option to turn it off and the reminder. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is going to be uh, this is the next set of studies that we ran on Habit Lab. This is uh, a study of uh, looking at whether or not externalities exist in our system. And this is a paper uh, that we presented at CHI 2019 called Conservation of Cross Nation. Do productivity interventions save time or just redistribute it? So um, we saw this uh, slide earlier. Um, and, uh, and as we said, uh, there, there are a number of productivity tools that help users reduce their amount of time online, including rescue time, stay focused, and of course, our own uh, habit lab. Um, and uh, our question here is, is that time that we that we save, actually saved, or is it just being redirected to other unproductive activities? So um, we all often assume that interventions are isolated. So if you have Facebook and we have an intervention that's acting on Facebook, uh, resulting in a decline in time on Facebook, we assume that other sites, for example, YouTube, the amount of time you spend on those is going to be unaffected. Um, likewise, we assume that if we have interventions acting on one device, we assume that uh, the amount of time spent on other devices is also going to be unaffected. 
Um, and we're going to pose this question of, well, maybe that time that you're saving on one site is just being shifted elsewhere. So just to give you some theoretical intuition as to why this might be happening, we have a limited supply of willpower, and we need breaks and downtime. So if your intervention is preventing you from getting that, that, uh, that break, maybe you're going to go elsewhere to get that break. So um, this leads us to this hypothesis of, well, maybe there might be this conservation of cross nation effect uh, where reducing time on one site or app, for example, reducing time on Facebook is actually going to lead to an increase in time on the other apps like YouTube because, well, you didn't get your fix on Facebook, so you're going to go to YouTube to get it, right? Um, likewise, uh, likewise, reducing time on one device might increase in time on the others as well. Um, so, um, but there's, a third possibility, uh, well, maybe interventions uh, might actually have benefits outside the taps, the apps that they are targeting. And the theoretical justification for this is that apps are designed to be habit building, and it results in this habit loop of constantly checking uh, your, your sites and, or, and, and phones. So maybe if you manage to break this habit loop, well, you're going to also decrease the, the repeat visits and uh, reduce the amount of time elsewhere. So those breaking habit loops result in further decreases in time spent elsewhere. Um, well, maybe if, you, if the intervention reduces in time on Facebook, uh, if we break the habit loop, and as a result, time on other sites, like YouTube, is also going to decrease. Or likewise, if you reduce your time on your computer, your time on your phone is also going to decrease according to this theory. So for our first research question, uh, we want to investigate whether uh, how interventions on one site or app are influencing time on other sites and apps. And so when you reduce time on one app or site, um, there's three possibilities we consider. Isolation, there's no, there's no change. There's the possibility of increasing in a time on other sites and apps, which we call the redistribution hypothesis. And there's the possibility of decreasing the amount of time on other sites and apps, which we call the reduction hypothesis. Likewise, we have another research question uh, asking the same thing at the level of devices. If you reduce times on, on one device via interventions, how is the amount of time spent on other devices in, uh, changed? Again, same isolation, redistribution, reduction hypotheses. So, um, so the first thing that we want to do before we actually start in investigating this question is we want to confirm just uh, as a sanity check that our interventions actually work and are actually reducing the amount of time uh, on the focal goal because that was kind of the prerequisites for, that was the prerequisite assumption. So in order to investigate this question, what we do is for each goal, we randomly assign it to one of two conditions each week. Um, we have a frequent condition in which on every visit to your, on every visit, that is every time you visit the site on the browser platform or every time you open an app on the Android platform, we're going to show an intervention every single visit. And then there's the infrequent condition in which only 20% of visits we're going to be showing intervention. Um, this infrequent condition was actually intended to approximate no interventions. Uh, the reason we went for infrequent as opposed to no interventions at all is because when users install Habit Lab, they're expecting to get interventions. And so if, we, if they say it and we're like, oh, we have all these interventions, and they get no interventions, they're like, oh, this is broken, and they'll uninstall and give us zero stars, right? So uh, this is the closest we can do. Um, so um, what we do here is we compare the daily time spent on the days in, in which the users were in the frequent condition compared to the infrequent conditions for every one of the goals. And so this was done over the course of 5.8 weeks with 1,034 users on the browser and 876 users on the mobile, on the mobile version. So the first finding we found was that interventions are effective on both platforms. There's 7.3% reduction in the daily time spent on the browser version. This, this is least significant. Um, and there's 37% reduction in daily time spent on the Android version on the frequent weeks compared to the infrequent weeks. Also, this is least significant. So, uh, so, the, so in our first study, we found that indeed our, effect, our interventions are actually effective at reducing time on the focal gore. So, um, Next, we're going to actually study the, the, the research questions that we posed in, in the beginning. Firstly, how is the time redistributed to other sites on the same platform? Yeah, what up? I have a methodology question. Yes. So you, have, you now have these 12,000 users. Yes. I assume you didn't have that many back then, but okay. is it, if I install it, am I essentially opting into any of these experiments, or do you do separate recruiting from your pool? Yeah, so, uh, 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 so for each of these um, experiments, we basically start them, and we always use Per, uh, fresh users, um, uh, yeah, like so. So each of these, like the, all the five thousand users that we mentioned here, those are only users who are starting to install after we launched this thing. Um, in terms of, do we recruit separate from the pool? Um, when you install a thing, the first page that you get is this little IRB notification, which is like by installing Habit Lab, you opt into all the experiments, and we collect all your data. Um, and so, um, yeah, we don't collect separately. They're, they're just. 
how long, even though you're only doing a 10-day experiment, how long does it take you to get enough users through to get the... Oh, yeah. Um, I guess it depends on the, the rate at which the people are coming in. I think like at the time I was running this particular experiment, I think I had around like 50, to 50 installs per day or something like that. Um, so yeah, the, it, it, it takes a few months to collect these. Yeah. Um, all right, so, okay, so to investigate whether or not time is redistributed within the, plat within a, the same platform, what we did was we developed this metric of how intense interventions are this uh, day, which we we'll call intensity. And we defined intensity as the percentage of sessions on a goal that triggered intervention. So, uh, for example, if you visit Facebook 10 times and you saw zero interventions, then the value of the intensity is going to be zero. If you visited Facebook 10 times and you saw three interventions, then the intensity is going to be 0 0.3. And we verify that on days when the intensity is higher, then the overall time of the goal is going to be significantly lower on both of the platforms. So, um, so in order to, the, the manipulation we did was that we randomly assigned each goal to have either frequent or in, infrequent inter interventions each week. And because you just have a number of different inter, uh, goals that they are being randomized across, this actually results in a continuous intensity value, value that's from zero to one. Um, so the first, uh, uh, study we want to do is is see whether when days on days when the inter intensity is higher, what is the effect on the time spent on the non-goal absence sites? Um, and what we did here was again a linear mixed model where the fixed effect was the intensity, the random effect was the user, and what we want to see was the total effect on non-goal sites. That is by reducing like when the intensity is higher on the on the focal goals, what is the effect on the other non non-goal sites? Um, and what we find is that is that if the intensity is higher, um, which is resulting in lower time on, on the focal sites, uh, there's actually a reduction in the time spent on the other sites when the intensity is higher. That is, there's a 15% reduction uh, of time estimated when the intensity increases from 0 to 1, statistically significant according to our LMM. On mobile, we find no significant effect of time on, um, on, of, of one app on the other apps. So, returning to our first research question, when we reduce time on one uh, site via VR intervention, what is the effect on the other ones? Um, we find that in the case of the browser, it's reduction. Uh, time on the other apps actually decreases. But in the case of mobile, it's actually isolation. There's no effect. As to why this occurs, um, we suspect that's because there's a number of aggregator sites, such as Facebook, that often link to other domains. So by reducing the amount of time on, on Facebook, we reduce time on other domains because you're not going to be f going to Facebook, following these links, and then going off to these other sites as well. Um, on mobile, well, the reason we suspect there is no effect is that mobile goal apps are mostly messaging oriented rather than aggregators. And sessions are short and often followed by turning off the screen. So unlike the browser case, where you're going to be, uh, where, the, where Facebook goes often like drives you to, to other sites, um, in this case, you visit Facebook, respond to your short message or whatever, and just turn off the screen. Okay. Yeah. So you have it across a whole bunch of different applications to do yes. an analysis where you go, OK, these things that people are using mobile, they don't work. They don't cause this effect, but maybe Facebook, where we saw it a lot. Yes. Uh, look at uh, per application yeah, yeah, yeah. So the LMM, we do actually have the particular site or application uh, being intervened on um, in this uh, in the analysis. Uh, so yeah. Um, so this does account for that. Um, we also looked at um, at the let's see, let's see, uh, like what was most commonly selected. Um, I also did like this. I also did this this analysis individually on, on particular apps. I did find that like, for example, for like Facebook, um, for Facebook and Reddit, I think the, uh, the browser effect did hold. It was like a number of other non aggregator sites on which we didn't observe that effect. So, um, so yeah, I do believe that it was so aggregator. Then more about the type of app rather than yes. the mobile versus mobile. I believe it's, yeah, it's actually more about the type of app rather than the, rather than the platform. However, if you look at the sites, the types of apps that people are choosing, um, what we found is that the most common like 10 ones that like that people were saying they want to reduce time on on mobile, they're like mostly these messaging oriented apps, very few aggregator type apps. Um, and uh, on the browser, they were like the bulk were aggregator type, type apps. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Also another thing is that uh, many mobile apps like Facebook, they embed an in app browser, so visiting external links will re will remain within the same app. Okay, so so returning to our first research question, um, we want to see whether uh, reducing time on one site is going to reduce time elsewhere. 
uh, um, and what we find is that on the browser, we observe this reduction effect, but on mobile, where it's isolation. Finally, we want to observe whether or not time is redistributed across devices. Um, so here, what we want to see is when time is higher, the methodology we use is basically the same as in the cross uh, within the platform case, except this time it's with, uh, between devices. So when intensity is higher on one device, what is the total effect of time spent on goal sites on the other device? Uh, we, we had a smaller size because we need to have participants who are using HabLab on both the mobile and the, the, uh, the Chrome platforms at the same time. Uh, we managed to figure out who was who just by having them, allowing them to log in. Um, in this case, we can use the linear mix model, um, same structure, except this time where we're looking at is intensity on this device as opposed to uh, on, on a targeted app or site. We find that there's no significant effect on either uh, in either direction of uh, browser intensity of interventions of browser interventions on mobile time or um, mobile intensity on browser. Okay. Um, so just returning to our second research question, in this case, it's isolation in both directions. As to why there we didn't observe any cross device uh, effects, um, firstly, uh, laptops and phones are used in different contexts. Um, so, so perhaps like we wouldn't expect any kind of interaction there. And also another thing is that unlike browsers in which, like for example, in Facebook, there's actually like these links which you click on that bring you to other sites, there's no such thing as a, a cross device link. There's relatively few uh, apps or sites that start prompting, prompting you to use the other device with the exception of, for example, two-factor authentication. So, um, so basically we found that uh, time is not redistributed across devices for, as the answer to our question of whether time is redistributed across devices. So um, to, uh, uh, the discussion of this study is that we didn't observe negative secondary effects of the productivity interventions on either other sites, product, uh, apps, or devices, uh, which is actually a really good thing because we, because we started with this little horror story of, oh, the productivity interventions aren't actually doing anything and just shifting time around, and it turns out that that's actually not the case. And in fact, on browsers, we actually have this beneficial effect in that reducing time on one uh, site is actually going to reduce time on others, which we believe to be mostly due to aggregator sites. So in terms of the implications of this, um, when we're designing our interventions, we should consider effects on not just the target behavior, but on the workflow as a whole. Um, and of course, there's a number of limitations to this work. Firstly, we're only monitoring time on the phones and the browsers. So for example, if the time is being redistributed to non-digital activities, so for example, um, you're reducing the time on the browser, on Facebook or whatever, but the result is you're watching TV, we can't observe that, right? Because uh, we can't monitor that. Um, we also only study the productivity domain, so, uh, so we should be very careful about, about generalizing this result of there's no negative secondary effects uh, to other behavior change domains. Um, I don't make that claim. Uh, so just, uh, so just to summarize, we looked at whether or not reducing time via interventions reduces time spent elsewhere. Um, within device, we found that there's a reduction effect on the browser, but not on mobile. Uh, across device, we didn't observe any effects. We believe the, the reduction effect on the browser was due to aggregator sites driving traffic to other sites. And on uh, the cross device uh, case, it's because users, we didn't observe any effects because devices are used in different contexts. Okay. So. Um, so yeah, so, so this was a paper we presented at CHI 20, 2019. Um, okay, uh, so for final, um, for final study, we're now investigating what, how users' in preferences change over time. So just to remind you, uh, whenever users uninstall, we have this little prompt that, that we ask, why are they uninstalling? And one of the interesting things we found was that users actually have very different expectations for what they want productivity tools to do. So uh, we had many users who say that interventions were too hard, but a lot of other users were like, the interventions are too easy. So um, this, of course, leads us to a rather tricky situation in that we can't satisfy both of the users without personalization. So um, what we developed was, well, our first initial thought was, well, we can just classify the intervention difficulties and then just ask the users during onboarding what difficulty you'd like to prefer and just show them that. So that is, in, in fact, what we did. Um, and uh, so uh, here, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a screen that we showed during onboarding in which uh, we asked them how aggressive do you want to have allowed to be in helping you reduce your time along. We gave them four options. First, uh, firstly, there's the don't do anything. There's uh, no interventions. Easy, light touch, which is easy interventions, medium interventions, or hard interventions. And this is how the distribution of how users choose uh, them. This is across 5,000 users. And um, 
And basically, the ranking is uh, from uh, it's easy, medium, hard, and nothing is the is the order in which they choose them. And these are all statistically pair, significant pairs according to chi-square test. And one thing that you might want to uh, note is that only 8.8% of the users, that's the fewest, uh, is uh, are saying that they want no interventions at all. Um, as we'll observe, this is actually going to change. Um, so, so firstly, users are really optimistic initially about how difficult they want their interventions, with no intervention being the least frequently chosen category during onboarding. Um, so this leads us uh, to the question, well, OK, so users said that this is the, during onboarding, that these are the, the difficulty of interventions that they think is going to work well for them. Well, um, do their preferences change over time? Are these predictions during onboarding actually accurate? Um, and to investigate this, what we did was we gave this little experience sampling um, option in which every time you visit a site, um, we're going to ask the users about the intervention difficulty preference that they have for this particular visit. Um, so basically, every time you visit the site, you can say, I want for this visit no intervention or an easy intervention or a medium intervention or a hard intervention. And here, what we do is uh, we plot uh, for, for users uh, over time the, the choices that they make uh, in this experience sampling prompt. And so what we have is here we have 223 users who, uh, who answered this question at least 200 times. And, um, and basically, the, the colors, they, they code what intervention they chose during this experience sampling prompt. So uh, this dark blue is new intervention, and, uh, and easy, medium, hard as you get closer and closer to yellow. And one of the interesting things we observe is that uh, at the start, there's actually a lot of color changes, that, which is representing a lot of initial exploration between the different, different intervention difficulties. But over time, after about 100, you actually look that uh, the intervention preferences are actually mostly stable with the users responding con fairly consistently um, with their preferred intervention difficulty. Uh, do, do I see the what? Yes, oh, okay. uh, uh, it's actually, um, so it's every time you visit, um, so, so basically this is going to be multiple times per day. So every time I visit a site that's on the list, yes. I get the uh, Yeah, yes. Yeah, um, and, so, and so initially what we see is that uh, there's actually relatively few users who say no intervention with only 29 of them fairly consistently choosing from the start, I want no intervention. But uh, by the end, about 119 out of 223 users, that is the majority, are consistently choosing to have no intervention. Um, so what we see is that, uh, is that even though at the start, uh, no intervention is the least frequently chosen option, um, uh, after, after they've been using the system for a while, ha eventually half of the users are eventually choosing no intervention almost all the time. Um, and this leads us to the question of, uh, like, uh, can we determine whether when this intervention difficulty preference is changing? Um, uh, that is, how frequently do we need to uh, uh, ask, ask them to get these accurate results, and what are the costs of asking? Um, so in terms of the amount of time that, at, that costs users to actually choose this difficulty prompt, so that we showed this little experience sampling metric, and then the amount of time that from when it's shown to they actually click the button. Um, we actually look at this, it's actually only 1.2 seconds, so the time cost of the experience sampling is actually quite low. Um, uh, that said, if less than a day has passed since they're last asked, the user are less likely to answer, so they'll just ex ignore the prompt entirely. Um, uh, so. Here's one, this is the one day point. If it's less than that, if you're asking more, if it's been less than a day since they last saw that, that prompt, there's lower response rates. If it's been uh, more than a day, it actually looks fairly level at around uh, a bit more than 0.5% per, response rate, 50% uh, response rate per visit. And one of the other things we find is that um, if we vary the, the uh, the frequency at which we, we show this experience sampling, um, so between uh, zero point, uh, if we vary it between 0% probability of getting the thing, 25%, 50%, or 100%, uh, we find that, um, that when we have it more frequent, this increases attrition. So in terms of how frequently you need to ask to get accurate results, it's actually, um, we find that prediction accuracy declines as sampling frequency decreases, and that if you're sampling once a day, you actually get fairly accurate results at around 50, 80%. Um, so, so, so daily still gets fairly reasonably high accuracy. So we find that the desired difficulty can be predicted quite well with periodic experience sampling. So 
To summarize what this project has been finding so far, we find that the user's preferences are changing over time, and maybe uh, once a day should be getting a good balance between accuracy and sampling costs. But um, of course, what do users actually uh, prefer in terms of how frequently we'd be asking them? Um, so in order to figure out and elicit the user's preference here, we changed this experience sampling uh, thing so that uh, in, instead of just asking the preferred difficulty for this time, we also ask them about when should you ask you next about difficulty. And we give them options of ask again next visit, one hour later, one day later, one week later. And we find that uh, here, um, there's actually kind of two things that, uh, that, that emerge. Firstly, uh, some users, they actually want to be asked every single time. Um, oh, and also, this, this is not raw counts. This is uh, how many users will choose most frequently this option. Um, but um, but a number of other users, they choose the week, uh, once a week, uh, next week option, so uh, which is the least frequent option. And if we look at the combination, the intersection of, of, of uh, which, which, which options we're choosing, we find that uh, the most com common uh, intersection is uh, I want to have no intervention, but ask me again next visit. So, um, so users are actually like very optimistic and hopeful. Um, uh, they, they're basically saying, I don't want intervention this visit, but ask me again next time. Uh, maybe, I'll, uh, maybe I'll change my mind. Um, and, and one thing that you may want to, to, to note with that is that uh, these users are all people who kept this installed. So, so they're not just saying, like, I'm tired of intervention, I'm going to uninstall. They are actually keeping the thing installed and yet still continually choosing, I want no intervention, but maybe I'll change my mind. Okay, so, um, so one of the interesting things we found uh, was that, well, it looks like if we give people choices, many of them are eventually going to start gravitating towards the easy path. And it looks like some of our users are actually somewhat aware of this. This is a, this is a, this is a comment I noticed on, on Reddit, like right around when I started this, this, uh, this experiment. I find myself mindlessly clicking don't do anything, would prefer to have nudges on by default without an option to determine the, the strength before each Facebook visit. So this user is basically acknowledging, well, these choices, uh, he doesn't really have the, like, the good level of control to, to control himself and like, say, like, I don't want any nudges. So he'd rather, he doesn't even have the, the choice. So we went ahead and investigated this. What happens when we remove the choices? So uh, if we ask the users for their initial preferences during onboarding, and we ignore those preferences and just randomly assign them to various different, in, different intervention level, difficulty levels. And then what we did was uh, we actually find, interestingly, attrition rates actually, there's no effect of this. Uh, there's no significant effect on the attrition levels. Uh, this is shown with the Cox regression. Um, uh, so no significant differences in attrition rates between if you're assigning them to no intervention, easy, medium, hard. Um, and actually, uh, randomly assigning these intervention levels improves the eff efficacy of interventions. So what we show here is the more total time uh, spent daily on sites in each of the conditions based on what you're randomly assigned to. And, um, and there's less time spent with the hard interventions. Uh, independent samples t-test shows this is uh, significant. So um, what we find is that uh, Assigning users harder interventions works to help combat these issues. Uh, so this leads to an interesting discussion where uh, we, we started this project with the intention of, well, we'll we're going to be more personalized and help uh, respect these user preferences, but we find that actually randomly assigning them harder interventions seems to actually perform better than giving them a choice. Um, that's what we, of course, would like to be able to prefer to respect these user preferences. Um, and so perhaps one potential solution we can investigate is maybe we can solve this by changing the set, the set of choices. So for instance, uh, in, a, in a healthy eating domain, maybe instead of giving the, the choice between the fries or the salad, maybe the choice between the broccoli or the spinach. And indeed, there's a number of studies that, that show that the choice that the user makes depends on the set of options that you give them. Likewise, we maybe we, instead of giving users the choice, the, actually the choice, I don't want to see an intervention, maybe make the choice between the intervention a and B, where they're both pretty hard or like effective interventions. And uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, that, that last bit is future work. Um, so it, to summarize this project, we found is that users def defer in the preferences for the intervention difficulty. They're, they overestimate their motivation. If uh, Over time, they eventually gravitate towards having no interventions at all. And that if we give them harder interventions without asking, that improves the outcomes. So uh, this leads us to our conclusion. Um, so what we did was, so, so we investigated behavior change systems effects on, on users, and we find that, they that uh, these effects change constantly. That is, users' preferences during onboarding may, may not still be true a week later, and initial observation effectiveness are subject to novel novelty effects. 
Additionally, there are secondary effects in addition to the targeted outcomes. So by reducing the time on aggregator sites, time elsewhere is also reduced, was, one of the, was what one of our studies found. And therefore, the recommendations that we make is that we should perhaps periodically be doing some experience sampling and, chain, and change to adapt to the users as possible. We should not assume that everything during onboarding is going to be true forever. Likewise, when we do our measurements, um, to take into account that there are secondary effects, we should be uh, measuring outcomes holistically. Okay. In terms of future uh, work, there, there's, of course, uh, uh, behavior change taxonomies that are organizing theories for how behavior ch uh, change interventions can work. So if we want to investigate how these in theories actually work, uh, how much do the theories actually matter? And so what we're doing currently is implementing interventions that cover a behavior change taxonomy and measuring the intervention effectiveness and nutrition rates for each of them. In terms of more distant future work, um, what we focus so far here is online behavior change. Um, but with the increasing ubiquity of sensors and wearables, could we build perhaps in the wild behavior change uh, platform in the physical world? So this leads to our thesis statement of in the wild experimentation is a powerful tool to gain insights about behavior change systems at, at scale, specifically it allows us to conduct a wide, wide variety of studies about and interventions and their outcomes. Uh, in terms of acknowledgments, there's of course Michael Bernstein, our, um, my advisor. I had a number of, of wonderful uh, undergraduates and master's students uh, who contributed to this work. And of course, I had wonderful lab mates in the HCI group that made this possible. So uh, that concludes my talk. Um, just to summarize, uh, we, uh, we built a system habit lab and we conducted three different studies. The first one, uh, we found that in terms of effectiveness uh, remaining constant as, as time passes, we find that uh, effectiveness of stack interventions falls over time and rotating them helps. Uh, in terms of externalities, we found that on browsers, reducing time one site uh, leads to reductions elsewhere, but we didn't find other externalities. And we found that in terms of changes in user preferences over time, we found that users initially choose harder interventions, and the choice of difficulty falls over time. Thank you.